Welcome to Donuts, Design, and Debate, the podcast about design and things that are interesting to designers. It's your chance to enjoy a short and sweet bite of conversation about design. We talk about what's firing us up, designs that discourage, and designs that inspire. We're your hosts, Matt Robison and Aaron Dietzen. And what's going on today, Aaron? All right, well, first things first, we got to talk about this, uh, this extra D you just slung there. So a week ago, I believe we were called the Donuts and Design podcast, and now we're referring to ourselves as Donuts Design and Debate. So Triple D, 3D. That's right. We, yeah, we can't call it Triple D. Well, see, that was, <laughs> okay. that was the problem before we wanted to call it the D&D podcast, but it turns out there's some game out there that people, I don't know, I, I'm, not, I'm not into those, you know, entertainment or fun things. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, we actually had, there was, there was a couple other groups that uh, had a name close to that. So we decided we were going to set ourselves apart and we we're going to go with the uh, 3D podcast, Donuts, Design, and Debate. That's right. Uh, we're adding another word and uh, we'll be adding another word every week. So uh, <laughs> if you have any ideas for more words we can add on next week, let us know. Um, the show perhaps. will get longer and longer each week too, because we have to keep saying those extra words. A big game of telephone. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. One year in, just wait. It'll be 24 hours. That's right. um, marathon cast. Um, but yeah, no, for sure. It's uh, it's an interesting change. And, you know, podcasting is an iterative process, just like design. And uh, so anyways, we are we are kind of tweaking the name and also the format a little bit um, as well going forward. So that's right. So the way this show is going to work this time, is uh, we have a topic we're going to share. We're going to share a little bit about the topic, and then both Matt and I will take the pro and the con of that and do a little debating about uh, about those points. The way we will end this is we will make our cases. We will go back and forth a little bit, and then we're going to leave it to our live listeners to actually help vote to decide the winner of the debate. So the way this is going to work is Last week, our, our first show, we talked about principles of design. We started with uh, Dieter Rams's 10 principles of design, and we narrowed it down and edited it to fit our show. So what we came up with is our five principles of design, our five points that we will try to run all of the topics we bring up against. So just so you guys have a high level idea, so the things to think about as you run through this, when we're done, we'll be voting on how this topic compares against our five points. The first is, is it useful? Is this item design useful? Second is, does it have aesthetic appeal? Then is the design simple? From there, is the design environmentally friendly? And finally, is this design honest? So those yeah. are our five principles. Yeah, we simplify the original 10, you know, we thought, let's pare this down to just the essentials. You know, and you guys help us do that. Yeah. So appreciate that. Yeah, keep that in mind as we're talking today, for sure. But the, those will be how we're voting at the end. And then um, if it is in the positive, if the if the votes outweigh for, for instance, is it useful, it will get a donut. That's like our star rating. So um, it'll be out of five donuts, five design donuts. That's right. Uh, so, so that'll the, be the score for each particular design. The best a design can do is it can walk away with a podcast, five donuts. That would be the, that, would, that glows, five donuts. And yeah. choir. Just shy of a uh, half dozen. That's right. What is, so Baker's dozen 13. What's like one shy of half a dozen? I'm not really sure. Half a baker? Child baker. Baby baker. Dozen. <laughs> yeah, baby baker. <laughs> All right, so let's get into it. So this week, you guys already saw the title of the podcast is Gentrification Design. So we don't want to get into necessarily talking about or debating gentrification itself. Uh, we kind of picked that as a title that we thought was fairly uh, something you might click on. <laughs> Hot button topic, a controversial issue. <laughs> No, we want we wanted something simple, and we want to like try to put design on, onto it. So gentrification design is kind of what we came up with. Um, rather than talk about the idea, the concept of gentrification, which maybe falls outside of design, we did want to pick uh, a symbol of that process. And and one of the things we came up with is the the five over the five over one or one in five 
uh, buildings. You guys have, everybody has seen this at some point. Uh, they're the buildings that get built up. It'll be like a quarter, half a city block. And the first floor is all commercial. And then above that is two, three, four floors of residential. Uh, a lot of people kind of identify that as gentrification when it happens in their city. Um, it's got a lot of people who are opposed to it, but I think there's also a lot of reasons that it is possible. Um, of course you do. I, Spoiler alert, <laughs> Aaron's on the, on the good side. Um, but yeah, we don't have to get into opinions yet, but um, I think one, one, so the reason why it's called five over one is because of the international building code. Um, Aaron's jumping on a donut for the audio listeners. Um, <laughs> but uh, so, uh, so the tier one of building code is like concrete, like very fire resistant. Um, and then above that is the fifth category of uh, construction, which is like uh, just wood based. So, um, you know, it's, more inex it's inexpensive compared to making the entire building out of concrete um and you know these kind of buildings also like fulfill a lot of codes that are uh that are similar across a lot of different urban you know uh, development authorities or whatever so um i think that's part of the reason why they're somewhat common but they're you see them on, in a lot of different urban environments, uh, especially in North America, mm -hmm. um, but I'm sure abroad as well, so. Right, so we're gonna dive into this. And the way this is going to work is, uh, before the show, we determined that one of us, myself, would take the pro side and Matt is going to take the way easier to do concept. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we flipped a coin. This was <laughs> left up to the fates. <laughs> I didn't have anything to do with it. Right. I did flip the coin, so. He he, he did. He, he he promised me that this is how the, the coin flip went. Oh, it's just <laughs> off the camera. You can't see it. Look, it's right here. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so, so what we're going to do is we're going to spend a couple minutes each kind of presenting the pros and the cons of this specific design. Uh, and then we're going to talk about it some more. We want the, if you're here uh, listening to this live, then we'd love to hear your debates or, or your, your comments as they come up. Go ahead and type them in. If you're listening to this as a podcast or recording, then join us next time and maybe we can uh, get your voice in on the debate. So, yeah, love to hear your input. With that, let's uh, let's go ahead and start it. So our standard is going to be pro will go first. So I'm going to dive in and just uh, tell you guys why these buildings, these uh, five over one or that's that's the right term, right? I keep wanting to say like, yeah, one five, of, five over yeah. one, one plus five. Um, One plus podium, five, podium building is also another term used to describe these uh, type of buildings as well. That is, that is, those are the things we're talking about. Yeah, but without further ado, I definitely want to hear your, so I will be silent during this part. I'm just hearing your opening argument, All as right. it were. So uh, let's hear it. What's, what's so good about this kind of gentrified architecture? All right, so <clears throat> fact of the matter is, um, these buildings are not being built just anywhere. They're not going to get like uh, put down in rural locations. The places that they're getting picked to be put are places where people want to live, where people want to work. And generally speaking, in places are put in, land is at a premium. So it is difficult in these locations to create new commercial locations or places to live. A lot of spots that, where they're doing this commercial is being put into existing buildings. So that's very limiting as far as how many people can go in to uh, you know, open new commercial spots in these, in these spots. The fact is that this kind of architecture, this kind of design is, I'll say, somewhat utilitarian. It is built for a purpose. The purpose specifically is to take limited amount of land and make it available both for commercial and residential. So in a small space, in a portion of a city block, you can have, you know, three to decide the size of the building, of course, changes, but you may have three or a half dozen, a dozen different commercial spaces open up. And on top of that, two to four floors of multifamily residential. So what this does is this opens up those locations because like I said, these is, this is an in-demand location. This isn't just somewhere like that, that nobody wants to live. This isn't rural Nebraska, sorry, Nebraska. But this is places where there's already demand. So people want to live here, people want to work here, 
and this opens that up in a small amount of space. And this ends up being, you know, to use a, a hot term, a green option because you're taking a single section, a portion of a city block, and you're building it up. Whereas if we had to house the same number of people or open the same number of commercial locations new, it would take potentially multiple blocks, maybe even miles, square miles of land to do the same. Um, the other thing is that this is this is something that uh, I had I had a source and I lost it. Um, but majority of the times these are built, and not everybody likes them, but what ends up happening is most of the places these end up in, installed or created, property value raises around them. So they're actually long-term, they end up being very positive for landowners that are near where they get put in. Again, it's a combination of being the hot spot, the place to be, but uh, it also helps with, uh, like I said, having those commercial spots in there mixed into the residential. Um, the big thing, of course, that these buildings get knocked for is aesthetics, right? Because everybody goes, oh, they're just, they're, they're big concrete blocks or brick buildings or they're just boring to look at. Um, and I thought it was kind of funny because so I, I went back and I looked up like what other stuff that's good in architecture now was looked down upon when it first came out. And a couple examples that came up, one was Brooklyn's brownstones, right? So they're, they're, pretty iconic buildings now, right? They're, they're uniform, they kind of look similar, but uh, it's looked at as kind of being a good thing. It's the neighborhood, it's the, that feel. But when they were built, they were slammed for being boring, for being the same. It, people did not like that they were going in. Gentrification wasn't an issue then, but people did not like the way they looked at the time. So it is possible that we'll get down the road now, 50, 60 years from now, and these buildings will be like, uh, you know, have some historical reference and, and have a classic feel about them. The other thing I want to point out is there is an architect who is fairly famous. Probably you guys have heard of him. When he brought out a lot of his work, it was put down as being uh, not good, not right, not what you're supposed to do with architecture. Uh, he had a thing for flat roofs, putting flat roofs on before they were everywhere. He was also a huge fan of open floor plans. He didn't like this like little compartmentalized rooms. He said open floor plans and that was ridiculous, right? That was, that was nuts. That of course is Frank Lloyd Wright. His stuff that he came out with, people didn't like it aesthetically. They said it wasn't the right thing to do, but now, I mean, he's kind of like a standard in architecture. Name dropping is so, not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say my friend or, oh, so I was hanging out with Frank every day. <laughs> Uh, I just, so, and I, do just I, I want to say that, that uh, so I live in a town, Longmont, Colorado. It's about 30 square miles and has just under 95,000 residents, I think. Um, and we have a historic downtown section. So we have, I, I think it's like one or two square miles where the original center of Longmont was created 100 years ago. Old buildings. Um, Everybody wants to be there, but the commercial is so limited because everybody's on the first floor of these old historic buildings. They get renovated over and over and over again. So what's actually happening in our town is we have one block off of Maine, we have these buildings going up and it is bringing in new commercial options where everything was so limited before. Before it was, it was you're on Main Street in these buildings or you were a couple miles off Main somewhere because Main Street is surrounded by residential. So this is actually, we're seeing this in our own community. And it's, I mean, a lot of people are excited about this because it's going to bring in something new where everything is limited before. And the blocks where they're being put up were literally parking lots in some sections. And I think one was an old gas station where it was kind of an unusable space because the way it was, was built. And now it's gonna get new life as a handful of commercial spots. And then, like I said, several floors of residential. Only two floors of residential because we're on the front range and you can only build three stories high out here. It's a thing. We could talk about that in a different show. But yeah, so <laughs> I know some people have some things against these types of buildings, but I really do see that there is a need for them and they have a very positive impact on the communities that they're built in. Beautiful opening argument. Well done. Um, yeah, a lot of good points in there. Well made. So, uh, be challenged to 
but uh, I, would yeah. just, I would love to hear what you're thinking. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, and I, we're going to have like a cross cross examination or whatever, a cross talk after this. So, um, I'm not going to directly address your points at this moment, but, uh, I will sit here quietly stuffing donuts into my face as you talk. <laughs> I, I won't say anything. Though. How many do you have down there? You got a baby baker? Uh, no, I went a little light. I only got two donuts today because I was a little hungover after the last show. <laughs> yeah, I'll do that to you. Too much Boston cream last night. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I'm going to try to keep a straight face over here while I see you chomping up, uh, over on the other half of the screen. Okay, anyways. Um, yeah, so gentrified architecture, gentrification architecture, these one plus five buildings, why are they? bad that's what i'll be uh, arguing for today here and you know i think the first thing that jumps out to people like aaron mentioned was uh that they're frankly they're ugly they're not very aesthetically pleasing um that's a common refrain and the first thing people see and think of probably when they um experience these buildings for the first time or for you know any time um there's not they're not taking into consideration the context and the history of the place that they're being built in. It's more a, it's like an economic response, right? These are kind of, these are buildings that are designed by developers and restrictions based on, you know, just building codes, cost, and like you mentioned, um, you know, space limitations as well. So um, I think there's more to, architecture or there can be more, and I arguing should be more, um, to what goes into a good design of a building outside of just um, what is the, you know, um, the most efficient way to fulfill all the check boxes you need in order to, um, uh, I'm getting hot under the collar over here, I'd unbutton my top button. <laughs> um, to uh, being a PG podcast again. <laughs> to get those buildings built. So. Um, another thing about these kind of buildings is that um, because they're kind of very cookie cutter and um, they don't take into consideration where they're being built necessarily, there's not really as much interaction between the neighborhood and the buildings themselves. A lot of times they're, you know, pushed up very close to the street. There's not a lot of room left for foliage that would help with, um, you know, rainfall drainage it helps with like cooling down our cities it helps with the beautification um it helps with um you know uh, carbon dioxide offsets and uh like there's a lot of good that comes with having more foliage and these buildings uh kind of push that off to the side in favor of um uh the design specifications that they're that they're looking for um you know i think that um the a big thing that people would address is that they're just they don't have the imagination that i think architecture is known for you know there's a time and a place for sort of you know organic crazy buildings like zaha hadid kind of architecture but i think there's also there's a space in between where we are with this five over one and that you know insane blank check kind of building um that can be played with and that's maybe not being given um, the time that uh, it deserves. Um, you know, I think the space limitations that these buildings are a response to is um, is inevitable in the change of, of, of an urban environment that, you know, people moving in and wanting to live in a certain place and buildings, you know, coming and going is, is inevitable. But I think what I'm really arguing for here is that it can be done better um, and not not just, just like I said, checking off a list of, okay, it fulfills this, this building specification and this cost. And, um, and I'll leave you with one more thing that of course, because they, there's so much of this, um, this uh, wood built residential on top, it's like sometimes four or five stories of just like wood frame, um, that can be frankly a fire hazard in a lot of these cities. And, you know, if space is a limitation, you're packing more people in, but they don't have, um, you know, a, as much fire resistance as some other structures. I think that's something to uh, take into account as well because it's, um, it's, it's a hazard, frankly. So that closes my opening argument. So 
I just have one. Did you really harass me for saying Frank Lloyd Wright and then drop Hadid? <laughs> yeah, but I wasn't saying she would be in favor of these kind of buildings. You did not say that you weren't saying that. <laughs> oh boy, now we're really getting down to triple negatives. <laughs> um, so yeah, what what uh, what do you have to say in response to that? What do you? Well, I mean, I just I, I gotta I gotta echo Sven in our our chat here in the live recording, uh, who's who's pointing out this got twenty two level wood building, which I gotta just pause for a second and say, wow, <laughs> that's a big <laughs> Even, wood building. I didn't even know that was possible. Did they grow <laughs> um, trees that high? So that's that is one piece, and, and wood is being used, but they are getting made out of uh, less flammable materials, less combustible materials too. Light grade steel is being used in some of them, um, but uh, yeah, I don't I don't know the I don't know if I can buy that as as a point or not. Uh, you know, and I'm I'm arguing the other side. I get it, but. Uh, Saying that they're bad because they're wood, I don't know. It's like saying is there a three or four story building that's wood? It's bad. I don't know about that. One. Hey, I, I mean, hey, I like wood, right. but I just wouldn't know if I'd want to have the building I'm in on fire in wood. And Sven also what? says that wood is better in fire than metal. Um, that's a so, free debate. So as here, far as here's, I'm the thing, here's the thing about com or wood versus metal inside of a burning building. Mm -hmm. Wood, when it burns, it chars from the outside in, right? It cooks in the outside. And for wood to burn all the way through takes high heat and a long time. Um, steel works until it fails. So steel goes from working, working, absolute failure. Wood takes time. It also, wood does stuff like it bends and then comes back. Uh, so if you're talking about like residential building materials, wood versus steel, everybody's like, oh, wood burns. But steel melts. Steel gets hot and fails. Mm -hmm. So jet fuel, et cetera. Yeah. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> so this is the side you're on of uh, sort of truthing 9-11 and stuff like this. Uh, no, Maybe. I'm, just saying, I... I'm just saying people people pick this argument of, of wood burns and wood wood does burn. That is, that is the issue. So if you have a piece of wood and you expose it to high heat and flame, it can catch fire. Whereas steel and drywall by itself is not going to unless there's something else there to accelerate. I, I totally am not going to argue that. But uh, the fact is that wood buildings have a higher, I want to say survivability rate. That's not the word to use. They, they are structurally better off after a fire than, than uh, other residential steel frame materials. But like I said, I'm just, I'm just backing up uh, Sven here. Okay. Well, I mean, the, fi the fire thing is, is one piece, but it's not, it's not a huge part of, I think, what leads people to have a bad taste in their mouth when they think of this kind of architecture. You know, I think that um, it's kind of the, the homogeneity of it, how everything looks kind of the same, you know, there's in these, a lot of building codes, there's like, you know, you have to have varying facades so that it doesn't look just like just a flat side of a building. So it's literally just, oh, you need varying facades? Okay, let's just push this out a little bit. <laughs> and then so that's why you see the boxes, you know, that are just like, out and out and out and and it's like yeah that just <laughs> it looks even worse i mean it you know and they all have this like kind of siding on them that's uh like very similar i don't know exactly the name of it maybe somebody in the chat can help me out but these kind of you know this facade that just yeah it's ugly it doesn't do the job of you know welcoming people to the community and um yeah it just just not a good not a good look so I, I i get what you're saying but i always i just come back to the question of you know like i said it is it's it's a purpose-built structure right it's built to be cheap and easy and have no imagination put into it to be cost effective <laughs> <laughs> to i mean look okay look at what was the last uh school high school middle school you were near they all look the same. They're all the same brick building. They're boring. They they, but they're built for a purpose, right? And that's that is to yeah. I mean, it's the cost effectiveness is part of it. One of the reasons they get built in the spots they're being built is it's expensive to live and build there. So being able to save money is not necessarily it shouldn't shouldn't be looked down upon by any means. No, I 100% agree with that. I mean, this, this goes back to the gentrification. I mean, that's why it's called this gentrification building because it's in like, you know, 
these particular areas. And I obviously there's a need for housing and housing now and more affordable. Um, and that like, they have no qualms for me on that. I'm just saying that this could be done with a little more thought and a little more care as to the areas that it's being put up in versus just like one design fits all for urban block. Yes. Well, and that's, I, I kind of wonder about that. I think one of the things that makes it hard for these designs to win is generally they're being created in established neighborhoods, established locations where, like I said, for, for, for us in Longmont, hundred year old buildings a block over where they have, you know, every, every, I can't remember that they're, they're not very wide buildings, 30, 40 foot wide storefronts. And each one's different and each one has different colors and that, you know, building a block next to that doesn't look as good. Like, whereas that same block might look okay if it was in a different city and different location. Um, I think it's, it's put into a hard spot to succeed, right? Cause maybe that's, that's the thing you have to like be so many feet away, but that kind of ruins the point of it, right? Is the location is why it's being built there. That's, that's hard. Uh, ANSI is saying adjacent lots ought to be built with 20 year intervals. So by the time the next block goes up, this is classic architecture. <laughs> yeah, that's one thing that you said that I, I do not necessarily agree with this kind of, I've seen it referred to as H&R block green, that like very, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know, <laughs> is it agreeable? It's like agreed upon by enough people said this doesn't necessarily make me want to vomit that it kind of <laughs> has a even level of nausea among everyone who sees it, you know? I, I think the green thing, and this, this is a slight tangent, but I think it's just a cheap attempt to make things look greener. Okay. I mean, like, like oh, literally, green. like we're building in the middle of the city. Well, let's throw some green up there. Oh yeah, <laughs> people will but, forget they're in the city now because it's got a green panel inside. Right, but, <laughs> urban green. Yeah, you look out your window and all you can see is forest green. TM. Well, um, uh, yeah. Go ahead. I, I, I gotta say, I, I, I think, I think you had some, some strong points. I think, I think, honestly, when I walked into this topic, I was like, ooh, there's, there's not two sides of this. But the more time I spent looking into it, I was like, you know what? Of our, our five principles, I personally was going through, and I went back and forth on them. Like, I did not have a shutout in my own brain. So Even on the aesthetic yeah. point? Well, I, I'm saying 1.1 1. 1 for each one. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't argue yeah. each point back and forth, but okay. some of the points okay. went one way, some of the points went the other way. <laughs> so uh, I think it might be kind of kind of maybe about time to uh, to put this thing to a vote. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, how this is going to work is we're going to have a poll in the for the live folks um, that will say um, for each specific point of the design whether or not. For instance, the first one is, is gentrification design useful? And then you'll say yes or no. And Aaron and I will talk about that specific point as you are voting. So um, we'll, yes. we'll just go over the useful one right now. One. So yeah, go for it. This is one of those things where, I mean, I think if nothing else, these buildings are utilitarian. Like they, they, they are purpose built. This is not a thing where it's like, well, I'm going to make it pretty first and then see, you know, it's not a sculpture in a park where it's like, oh, and let's make it a drinking fountain too. This is like built for this thing. So if none of the, you know, I'm gonna have a hard time with the aesthetic argument. Totally, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just be straightforward with you. But I mean, the but I think like, hard. Is, the is, the, is the usefulness of a building just in that it like houses people only? Like, I think there's more considerations that can be brought in t from an architect perspective besides does it, is it like cheap materials and does it put a roof over people's heads? I mean, I think there's like, you know, how does it respond to the community? How does it like engage people to be friendly and like see other people's points of view when it's only doing one thing, which is like fulfilling a building code. And this is, this is technically a structure that you can live in and like purchase a Starbucks coffee in. You know, I think there, yeah, there's definitely is more to usefulness than just does it, does it do those items is my personal opinion. I can see that <laughs> the crowd doesn't agree with me. But. 
That's okay. We'll flip this around in just one second. I'm jumping right, in here so and voting for myself. Here. <laughs> it, 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 <laughs> it looks like we are getting, yes, it is useful. So, okay. Ding. That's one donut. One donut. So Next far. Design, single donut. All right. Nice. Let's move on. That poll's closed. Okay, cool. So I think this is a no brainer. Next one up is aesthetic. And let's get real here, folks. I don't think there's anybody on this call who should argue that these are aesthetic, like appealing aesthetically. They're, they're the same everywhere. There's no thought put in besides does it fulfill all these, you know, requirements. Um, it's not, it's not made to be pretty. Like you said, it's this is not part of the consideration whatsoever. This is made by a developer who's there to make money on land that they own. That's it. Art is in the eye of the beholder. Please vote. <laughs> That's a tough one. <laughs> I am. I'm interested to hear if, uh, if anybody in the chat has any other uh, idea of why this why these buildings could be aesthetically pleasing let us know because i'm i'm stumped i can move on okay <laughs> okay no donut for you no okay so we got um, aesthetics we got uh, one out of out of five donuts all right uh number three our third point here is gentrification design simple I think okay there's no question that it's simple but it's simple in the wrong way it's not simple in like an architecture like you know thoughtfully reducing things down to only what you need it's simple in the fact of this is literally all we care about it's not you're not taking other things into consideration and and honing them down to what's the most essential piece of this building you are um you're yeah you're simple in a bad way and i think this is about simple in a good way, in a good, well-designed way. Well, I think you're simple in a bad way. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, we reduced ourselves to name-calling. No, I think, <laughs> I mean, I think, like I said, say what you want about how they look. It is an example of uh, architectural design, which is not complicated. There are not frills. It is what it's supposed to do. It is, it is, I know that's the downside to it aesthetically, but it's just what needs to be there. It is nothing else. So you do have these, you know, that we have seen it with balconies, overhangs, um, awnings, that kind of thing. But that is about it. And that's it's just the simple, purest uh, form of architecture. It doesn't have anything there that doesn't need to be there. It might be driven by cost. It might be driven by something like that. But uh, I, mean, you, I don't think you can argue that it's not a simple architecture. Yeah, this just depends on your definition of simple. I mean, if it, if simplicity is just like capitalism reducing everything down to the most, you know, bottom line, <laughs> cost effective simplicity, then yeah, sure, it's simple. Yeah, sure. Go ahead, vote for it. But um, I think there's more things that should be taken into account, um, you know, than that when it comes to a building. All right. Looks like we've got another donut. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yes, donuts. rung out. Yes, has the day on uh, simplicity. All right. Up next is gentrification design environmentally friendly. Okay. So environmentally friendly can be looked at in a couple of different ways, but I'm going to say, of course, no, it's not environmentally friendly because, um, as I've heard you say before, from your own mouth, wood is not a necessarily the most. Um, efficient thing to build with. Also, I think, like I said, it's not only the structure itself, but what is missing outside of that? What are green spaces in our, um, in our, uh, in our cities that are forcing us to have higher AC and heating costs, you know, in the, in the off seasons, because there's not as much foliage there to provide, um, just natural, um, protection from those elements. Yeah, I get that. I, I get uh, it. I mean, anytime you build, you're going to build out of something. And uh, how maintainable is that that uh, material? That's that's the question. What I would say is when we just look at the pure mass of land that's not being developed. So uh, 
not just the materials being built, but the land that's being built on. If we look at a, a, a four-story building, right? So we have the commercial space. The commercial space is being built on the on the top or on the bottom. Above that, say you have three stories, ten apartments each. That's forty stories. That's forty families that aren't having houses build. They're moving in here instead. So we're looking at the the land that's not being settled for that. So a smaller footprint is being taken and there's less development happening. In that aspect, I really see this as being uh, a greener option than building, you know, dozens of extra houses and developing that much extra land. Yeah. And uh, we've got, <laughs> got a couple points out here and I'm just, I'm just reading the comments here, but uh, Jesse reminds us that as Matt pointed out, wood is being used in a lot of these builds and wood is a renewable use resource. So it does grow back. Um, Elia Bell Jr. is saying that stacking elements is better on the environment than spreading it. So building vertically, smaller footprint again, rather than going wide. So yeah. Hey, I can see those points. I also think there's probably a way that can be, that these buildings can be made in a more environmentally friendly way but they're not being that because there's not as much thought put into them besides put it up fast, put it up cheap. Hey, what are those ways? I don't know, but I'm sure there are <laughs> ways. There's, there's always opportunities for improvement, right? That's, that's kind of the tagline of the show. Yeah. Be better. <laughs> All right. Well, we didn't get a big vote on that. So I think there's some people riding the line on this one because we only yeah. had three people vote and I didn't this time. But we still, oh, four, there's four. So we did have four, <laughs> four votes for that. So we, we, uh, we have given this another donut. So we're okay. three out of four donuts. Hey, three out of four ain't good because that's not my side of the argument. Come on, guys. You got to give me something here besides aesthetics. Okay, last one. And for the last donut, um, does gentrification design feel honest? And this is one of the ones that I think we're exploring what the what the meaning of it is. Um, and I think, okay, first off, gut reaction is, yeah, sure. It shows it as it is. It, it is what it tells you it's going to be. Um, but I don't think that, I mean, the fact that the building exists at all is sort of a dishonesty to the people that already live there, uh, the the cultures and the traditions of the neighborhoods that these kind of buildings are being put up in. And that, I think, that's part of the reason why people think, like they think they're ugly, but the reason they don't like them is because they just don't fit. They're a sore thumb because they're dishonest to the area that they're being built in. So that means you should vote no on the honest donut. Well, and that's, I, I think, like Matt said, th this this is kind of our wild card in the voting process because the aesthetics could be interpreted in certain ways. Um, simple can be interpreted a little bit, but honesty really is the one where we're kind of, we, we, we put it in there. I mean, this is based on viewer votes, but we came back and said, well, honest, that's like interpreted. We can, we can get into that a little bit. And uh, from where I'm coming, obviously, I'm coming from the yes <laughs> side, but I just have to say that that there's nothing about these buildings that is anything other than what they're supposed to be. So, I mean, there I, I don't see these buildings misrepresenting themselves, representing themselves, anything other than a post that says, this is a place you want to live. This is a place that needs additional commercial residential space and when you have no in one package one simple package it's you know what it's it what is we're you we're giving you you have no regard for the people that came before you that already live here all that you care about is does this give me an apartment a walking distance to you know trader joe's if that's what you're looking for well i didn't even know there's a trader joe's nearby now i'm even more in favor of these things <laughs> Okay, you know, Sixth you know, Donut is a close to a Trader Joe's. <laughs> you know what these buildings are? These buildings are like the generic store brand of buildings. So it's like, it's you know, you go in and you're like, oh, here's a, I always think of the beer. You know, it just says, it's a white can that just says beer in black letters. <laughs> that's what this is. And that's, there's nothing more honest than I am a building, you can live in me. <laughs> 
All right. Well, what as, is the, as compelling an argument as that generic thing was? <laughs> so one person's uh, we got. Uh, oh, oh, we're, oh, 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 it's close. Okay, okay. So the the generic beer is what you're looking for. You want a no name building? Come on. <laughs> like oh, when you, when you think about a city, who thinks about like just the exact same building over and over? in every single city. Why would you want that? You want to go to the generic food store where everything just says what it is on the outside? That's not, and that, and frankly, we're talking about honesty here. That is, that is dishonest because like I said, again, this is going, the, the buildings don't exist on their own in like, not in a place, like you said, they're in a place where people want to live. And the, there's a reason people want to live there because of the culture of the, the, the buildings, the restaurants, the other, the other things that these kind of buildings are pushing out. And like you said, forcing up costs, this is gentrification architecture. This is forcing out people who live there and then it's, it's demolishing their culture and their traditions that they've established in this place. And um, yeah, frankly, it's disgusting. <laughs> wow all right well I, we, we got a we got a split vote which puts us at a half a donut so uh half a donut it is we're there right. we're at the end you guys we got it this this according to our ddd podcast three i want to say 3d podcast but that sounds i mean it parallels right but <laughs> uh it's it's uh our, according to our Donuts Design and Debate podcast, Gentrification Design gets three and a half donuts. Congratulations, Gentrification on Design. Gentrification Design on your new, oh, I don't have the applause button ready. On your new, <laughs> on your new, um, yeah. Rating? Yeah. Distinction as being uh, rated with three 3.5 donuts. Awesome. Okay. So that's basically how the shows are going to go. We're just going to take a different topic each week and um, <laughs> go over it, get the, the get that rating. How what uh, how many donuts does this particular design deserve? That's right. So so we will be doing another topic in about two weeks. We don't actually have the topic yet. We're we're still in the scrambling formation phase, but uh, we're hoping to get ahead of it and uh, put up a handful of topics that you guys can can see. So we'd love to hear your ideas. If you're here locally in the our live recording and type into the chat or the ask a question field, if you're listening to this as a podcast or watching the video in the future, email us at donuts at trimble.com and give us your ideas for topics or guests that we should see on the show. That is a worthwhile note. Let's let's touch on this real quick. Uh, we are forming this podcast. It's coming together. We do hope to have people besides Matt and myself talking about topics in the future. Uh, we'll just, uh, we got to get there. We got to grow. We got to grow into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So if you have an idea for a guest, you can also email the donuts at trimble.com for, um, or if you yourself want to be on the podcast, let us know. We'd love to hear. Absolutely. Um, yeah, but I think that's it for this episode. So, um, yeah, thanks for listening and uh, tune in. We do we record this live every other Thursday. Um, if you're catching it on YouTube and uh, or your podcast app and you want to join us live, so check it out. Check the the uh, SketchUp social feeds for that information. And um, yeah, we'll see you uh, in a couple weeks for another debate. Donuts debate design. No, donuts Close. design and debate. We're not two donuts over here debating design. That's not what the show is. We are not Donuts Debating Design. We are people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> donuts Design and Debate. Thanks for watching. See ya. This has been a Trimble Media production. Thanks for listening to Donuts, Design, and Debate. If you have an opinion about our topic today, or if you have an idea for a future topic, we'd love to hear from you. Um, send us an email at donuts at trimble.com, D-O-N-U-T-S at trimble.com. Don't forget to rate and review the show. It really helps us out. Thanks again for tuning in, and take care.